couldn't reach out to them. You know, the same hindrance he had, even to go to Rome. But he said, even though I couldn't come there to preach in the physical, I'm praying for you. Romans chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 22. Romans chapter 15, verse 22. For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you. He wanted to go to Rome as well. He wanted to go everywhere. Go to Philippi, go to Colossae, and go to Laodicea, and go to Rome, and go to Ephesus, and go everywhere. And he couldn't go everywhere. He wanted to go. And he said, yes, I know what I'll do. I'll be praying for them, praying for them. And so we understand that even though you cannot do everything like that in the physical you are also you are praying. We're looking at Ephesians chapter three. Ephesians chapter three, and I'm reading from verse fourteen. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He will grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by spirit in the inner man. He said, if I come to you, that's what I will do. I'll be strengthening you in the inner man, strengthening your spiritual life. Because I cannot come, there's something else I can do. I can make supplication. I can pray. And that's what he did. We're looking at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 verse 9. For they and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in, the, in knowledge and in all judgment. You know what Paul the Apostle did? He said, I shall come there, but I'm not able to come. I shall visit you. I'm not able to visit you, but it's something I'm doing every day. I carry on ministry towards you every day, the ministry of prayer and supplication. What a lesson we're learning. That we don't need to be somewhere physically before we minister to them. We can be praying every day and praying every time. And saying, oh Lord, raise up people that will get this work done. And touch those Thessalonian believers and those Colossians and those Philippians. Oh Lord, touch them and turn them around and make them to be the kind of people. They ought to be Colossians chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 9. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9. It says, for this cause we also, since the day we had it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that she might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I'm asking a question. If Paul the Apostle went to Colossae, what will he do? He'll teach them. What will the teaching do? The teaching will give them the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And he couldn't go in the physical. What did he do then? He began to pray. And so we understand that all those hindrances of the devil, we can pray. And when we pray, God will answer the prayer. And once we're praying, number one, we can send suitable substitutes. Number two, we can have the same supplication. And all that will be getting the work done. Our prayer can remove the hindrances of Satan. And it will. When the believer prays in the Savior's name, it is the same as if the Lord Jesus himself was making the supplication and making the request to the Father. Prayer changes things and prayer changes people and prayer changes circumstances and prayer makes a seemingly helpless minority a mighty force that can influence the destiny of nations. And so we understand what kind of prayer, what kind of prayer? We ought to pray. I want to tell you one, another thing. Is that Satan does not stop his hindrances. He tries to hinder prayer to you. He doesn't uh, hinder prayer, the prayer for bread and butter. He can allow you to go with that. To fill your belly if your soul is empty. And to fill your stomach if your spirit is empty. He doesn't mind about caring for material things. And praying for material things. The kind of prayer he tries to hinder the prayer of Abraham for Sodom and Gomorrah. That one, he'll try to hinder. The prayer of Moses for the children of Israel. When the children of Israel back and went gone away from the Lord. And now Moses began to pray, O Lord, count these people as your people. Restore them. Bring them back to your grace again. And count them as yours. If we have found grace in your sight, that's the kind of prayer Satan wants to hinder. He wants to hinder the prayer of Daniel that will take the time apart and wait upon the Lord praying for the people of Israel to be restored from their captivity. And the prayer that will restore backsliders from backsliding and will restore saints unto holiness, sanctification, righteousness, and purity. That's the kind of prayer Satan would like to hinder. The kind of prayer that Jesus Christ prayed. And Jesus said we should pray. That's the kind of prayer Satan tries to hinder. Now we're thinking about our nation. We're coming back to our continent, Africa. 
Many places they are praying, but there's kind of prayer they are not praying. The kind of prayer that Abraham prayed for Sodom and Gomorrah, they are not praying that kind of prayer. All they are praying for, give us healing, give us money, give us car, give us aeroplane, give us land, help us to build this and that, give us wives and give us children. That's all the prayer they are praying, most of the people, millions of people, as they gather together. But the prayer that will save Sodom and Gomorrah, the prayer that will turn all the tide of immorality and defilement, turn all that around, they are not praying that kind of prayer. The prayer that Jesus said we should pray, that the Lord will send laborers into the vineyard, into the harvest field, that kind of prayer, they're not praying. But it's only the prayer for materials, but the prayer for righteousness, for holiness, for sanctification, and for the strengthening of the churches, that kind of prayer, they're not praying. And the Lord is telling us, yeah, the Satan has succeeded in hindering many people from praying the right kind of prayer. And uh, the right kind of prayer, they're not praying all these other things they're praying for. I pray God will touch us. And as Satan has hindered other people from praying the, kind of, the right kind of prayer, we will not be hindered in Jesus' name. What kind of prayer we're praying? I want you to look at uh, Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad, as sheep having no shepherd. Then said he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, and the, but the and laborers are few. Pray ye therefore. That's what the Lord said. Pray ye therefore. That's what he commanded. Pray ye therefore. That's what he's expecting. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And that's uh, what Satan has successfully hindered in many places. The prayer that we pray, that will send laborers into the harvest. We were looking at that same thing in Luke chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Luke chapter 10, we're looking at verses 1 and 2. When you are not praying this kind of prayer, it means Satan is hindering you. When all the prayer you are praying is only for material things, superficial things, and only for physical things, the things that will perish here in the world. When that's the only kind of prayer you are praying, only for yourself. You're not praying for salvation of souls. You're not praying for servants and leadership and leaders to be raised up. You're not praying for evangelists and pastors to be raised up. You're not praying for churches to be planted. All the prayer you are praying, give me this, give me this, give me this. That means Satan has successfully hindered you from praying the kind of prayer. I pray that that hindrance will be broken today in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 1. It says, after these things, the Lord appointed all the 70 also. And he sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself will come. Therefore said he also unto them, The harvest really is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, pray ye therefore. As we are preaching, then we pray. As we are going out to the harvest field and bringing people to know the Lord, we're still praying that we know we cannot finish the work. We're saying, O oh Lord, raise up other people. Raise up laborers, raise up evangelists, raise up soul winners that will preach real, real salvation of souls and will preach real holiness of life and will preach real righteousness, purity in the lives of people that are coming to know the Lord. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. I'm looking at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, the kind of prayer the Lord is wanting us to pray so that all these hindrance, hindrances of the devil, the Lord will kind of destroy them and crush them. Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. That's the kind of prayer we're praying. Because that is the one that will be able to turn all the strategies of the enemy, the strategy of the, devil, of the devil, turn it upside down when the people are actually saved. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, we need to pray. Pray for the ministers and pray for all the ministers to be raised up. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me. And for me, Paul the Apostle said, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly 
to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. It's saying that it's not only the physical hindrance, there's the psychological hindrance, there's the emotional hindrance, there's the spiritual hindrance. You know, there are times you go to a place, it's not that you're not even able to go in the physical. You're able to go there physically. Like Paul, the apostle was not able to go to Thessalonica physically. And he's saying, pray for me so that God will open doors. Pray for me so that I'll be released and I'll be able to go. What if you go? And then the hindrances are still there. Oh, you saw can hindrances be there when you are there already? Acts of the Apostles chapter 13. Acts of the Apostles chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 6. And when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was by Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, such as Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. In this case, it wasn't a physical hindrance. It wasn't that the opportunity to preach was taken away. It wasn't that you know, the door was closed. The door was open. The man was there. He wanted to hear the gospel. And Paul, the apostle, was available to preach the gospel. In verse 8, but Elimus, uh, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, was to them, hindered them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. That's why I told you sometimes it's not even a physical hindrance. It's a spiritual hindrance, emotional hindrance, psychological hindrance or disturbance that will not want the word of God to come out and reach out to the people. That's why I say, pray for me, pray for me, so that I'll be able to preach and open my mouth boldly as I ought to speak. And Paul the Apostle became bold here, verse 9, then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him as boldness and courage. That's tenacity, that's resilience. And it says, and said, O fool of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. That's the prayer we pray, that these apostles and these evangelists and these pastors and teachers, as God is sending them for sending us forth, God will give us boldness. God will give us authority. And what we ought to say? will say and will not back down or turn back or cringe or give in or give up because of any challenge. And when the church prays, that's what we're going to have. We'll have it in Jesus' name. It says 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians, we're looking at chapter 3 and we're looking at verse 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free cause and be glorified even as it is with you that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all men have not faith. Have you noticed that whenever there is going to be a crusade, whenever there is going to be a kind of open air meeting, open air campaign, the people are busy praying, oh God give us miracle, oh God give us healing, oh God give us deliverance, oh God bring the sinners, oh God. The, the only thing they don't pray about is that the wicked men that may want to hinder the salvation of the souls, the wicked men and the, uh, the unbelieving men, the sinful men that may want to enter the free flow of the word of God, that uh, God will arrest those men and stop them in their track. The only thing they don't pray about is for the people who are going to minister, for the evangelist, the pastor, the preacher is going to minister, and for the people who are going to bring the power of God to bear in the lives of the people. And so the Lord is telling us here that whenever we're going to have meetings like this, we know that he Hindrances might come, psychological, spiritual, physical, circumstantial, or society, or whatever, or religious kind of hindrance. But if we pray, all those hindrances will be crushed in Jesus' name. That we may be delivered from unreasonable men and wicked men, for all men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. He will keep you from evil. 
We're looking at Romans chapter 15, verse 30. Romans chapter 15. And we're looking at verse 30 here. That we pray. Pray for your preachers. Pray for the pastors. Pray for the overseers, state overseers, regional overseers, national overseers. Pray for them that the watch of the Lord through them will have free course. And the power of the Lord through them will have real authority. And the name of Jesus will be mighty in their mouth. And the word of salvation will be very clear. And people who are sinners will be broken down, convicted. And they will come to know the Lord and have real, genuine salvation. Real change of life. Real transformation of life. In Romans chapter 15, verse 30, it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit that is trying to gather with me in your prayers to God for me. He says, you are doing this because of the love you have for God. But because of the concern you have for souls. And because of the devotion you have to the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, strive with me your prayers for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Strive with me your prayers for the love of the Spirit that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service, which I have, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. You're saying, yes, we can come. What if we come restricted and restrained? What if we come depressed and discouraged? What if we come sorrowful and sad? What if we come just, you know, just, just to obey, just to obey God and just to fulfill all righteousness? But then there is no joy in our service. You say, pray that all these things that hinder the joy of ministry and the free flow of the power of God that makes us to see the results and brings joy into our souls. Pray that all those hindrances of the joy of ministry, the Lord will take it away. And as the Lord answers your prayer, he'll bless the multitude, he'll bless the preacher, he'll bless you, the prayer warriors, too, in Jesus' name. We're looking at Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 4. Colossians chapter 4, and I'm reading there from verse 2. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, it says, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, without praying also for us. With all the prayers you are praying, with all the commitments you have in supplication, praying for us that God will open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make each manifest as I ought to speak. Prayer is very important. Somebody has written, captured the power of prayer like this. He said, prayer has divided seas, rolled up rolling, uh, flowing rivers, and made flinty rocks gush into fountains, quenched flames of fire. Prayer has muscle lions, disarmed vipers and poisons, marshaled the stars against the wicked, and stopped the course of the moon. Prayer has arrested the rapid sun in its great rays, and prayer has burst Open iron gates, recall souls from eternity, and conquer the strongest of devils. And prayer has commanded legions of angels down from heaven. We're talking about prayer, the prayer that the saints ought to pray, the prayer that believers ought to pray, the prayer that the church ought to pray for our ministers, for our overseers, and for the leaders, and for the evangelists, and pastors, and teachers. Prayer has bridled and changed the raging passions of men, and routed and destroyed the vast armies of.